Crew Nation, welcome back to Random Musings from the Clinical Trail Guru. This is episode 188. This is a redo, Chris. Probably uh, a good idea anyways. Yesterday's podcast was all over the place because of our fantasy draft, uh, which was we were doing simultaneously while doing a podcast, which is Sometimes a good idea, and sometimes it's an awful idea because you're not focused on the podcast. Um, but uh, I had a very good draft. I had a very good fantasy draft. Uh, like I told you earlier, I went to sleep so happy and woke up like the same way. It's like the same feeling you get when you bought something that is worth more than what you paid for. Like that same feeling is what I had last night and this morning. I just love my team a lot. Love it. This is the best draft. This is the best draft maybe I've ever had, but certainly in recent memory. Well, and nice. your experiences are the opposite this time around. Yeah, I'm not happy with my team as badly or as poorly as everybody drafted. I should have a much better team. Last year, you were thrilled with your team, and I was like iffy about my team. Yeah. And we have that documented live as well on the podcast. Right. This year it wasn't it was live and I had it I uploaded it and it was uh, I accidentally hit a button in GarageBand that turns our voices into robots. So we sounded all like you can't really understand what we're saying. Um but it's probably for the better cuz that was all over the place and we can be a lot more focused this time around. Sure. So before we get into the PI oversight and ethical issues in research, um, what is your draft fantasy football draft summary from the night? Give the highlights since people can't really listen in on the real draft. Well, there were a few people that uh, drafted, I don't know if I want to say well, but at least uh, uh, not poorly, right? There was a few. Right. Probably half, right? I would say. And there was a few that, uh, no, they they definitely had reasons behind it. One team was new and it was, has never played fantasy football. Uh, they drafted Matt Ryan. For anybody who follows fantasy football, others you can just fast forward maybe three minutes. But Matt Ryan was drafted basically in the first round. Matt Ryan. Um, this team took uh, two kickers. They also took two tight ends. And they only have one running back. So and yeah, <laughs> there was a lot of people taking two kickers. No, he was the only one that took two kickers. There's one. There's one that took no kicker. But I think you did the same thing last year. Last year, I accidentally didn't draft a kicker. Um, right. Because I wasn't paying attention to the rounds. So I just kept stacking up receivers, and then at the end, I emailed the commissioner, hey, I forgot to get a kicker. But he allowed me to drop, because you're not really allowed to drop players until after week one, I think. Right. Um, but I think he allowed me to do that so I could get a kicker. <laughs> yep. I didn't do that this year. This year was perfect for me. So we will give Guru Nation updates um, week by week. If I'm not doing well, you won't hear anything else about fantasy football. But if, uh, but if I'm doing well, you're going to hear about it every week, especially every on the week, weeks yeah. that Chris Auber, especially on the weeks that Chris Auber joins. Ah, even more yeah. so if it's the week we play, huh? Correct. So ah. let's get into what we were supposed to talk about yesterday: PI oversight ethical dilemmas let me give the context background okay because this is not a topic i would have ever decided to make a podcast on let alone like some bite-sized animation videos which this person's requesting i do for their hospital so basically this is a person that is a director of clinical research at a nonprofit hospital somewhere in the midwest they do a lot of research, but they're also a nonprofit hospital. So they're a regular hospital. Okay? Mm-hmm. But they happen to do a lot of research. And 
their her issue is many of her PIs are just uh, treading or flirting with a lot of gray area when it comes to ethical issues and research, which I think at the end of the day, a lot of us researchers get into if we're if we have patient interaction. Uh, but even the CRAs themselves, like, you know, there's a lot of gray area in this research. And matter of fact, life itself is mostly gray area. Like, that's just my opinion. But anyways, let's. so the issues that she's facing is her PIs are very enthusiastic about enrolling their subjects uh, or their patients into studies for whatever reason. Maybe they want to be KOLs for that pharma company. Maybe they're just interested in the actual research. Um, a number of reasons. But a lot of them are, they're not necessarily violating GCP or disobeying the the Declaration of Helsinki guidelines uh, when it comes to ethics. But they are... You know, like I said, flirting with that gray area where, for an example, there, um, if a patient uh, is taking an exclusionary med for a study, you know, but yet that's the doctor feels that that's the proper treatment for that subject or for that patient before they're a study patient, they're just a regular patient, the doctor will stop prescribing that treatment just so that they can fit in the study. Right. Like that's one of the issues she mentioned. Another one is using like their influence, because let's face it, doctors have tremendous influence when it comes to suggesting things for their patients. Um, uh, Like doctors have just a great amount of influence over their patients. And so the fear is that they're using their undue influence to go coerce patients into joining a study when that study may or may not be the most appropriate uh, option for that patient. And so my answer in short is it boils down to over-documentation and over-communication with the patient. Like in this industry, you cannot communicate enough with your patients and you cannot document enough. It's it's impossible to over-document and over-communicate, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. What is your take on these two things, Chris? So, um, I'm sorry, I was only half paying attention because uh, we covered all of this yesterday, but we're going to do it here again. Um, yep. So, over document and over communicate in terms of um, what? Sorry. Well, as far as the undue influence of a PI, as far as like taking out okay. their. Uh, prescribed meds, is it ever possible, you know, my my, my suggestion to them, and it, it's going to be in these animated videos, is to over-communicate and over-document. Because um, you can't do enough documentation of process of consent. Most sites under-document their process of consent, or they just write boilerplate template, you know, process of consent for the, everything's the same for the same patient, for every patient. When in reality, that's probably not what happened. The PI probably discussed, you know, different options with the patient. Well, what options did they discuss? It should be all written in the process of consent. Well, uh, again, <clears throat> if we're discussing patients refer or doctors referring their own patients, um, I don't, because that would be prior to the patient entering the study. I would probably document that in the medical records, right? For the patient. Yeah. Yeah. In which you would include those medical records once they do sign consent um, in the patient chart. Right. So the the documentation should read something to the effect that before changing patients meds, they were confronted with the possibility of entering a study and they were made aware of, what they could expect by participating in the study. They're given all possibilities, not necessarily something that would require a consent, just that 
this drug or, or procedure or device, whatever it might be, um, could potentially benefit them or it may not, right? If it's a drug and there's a placebo, um, <clears throat> opposed to continuing on their, pres- their current prescription, right? The current regiment of medication, right. which needs to be changed in order for them to, to be allowed to enter the study. Just so long, and I'm kind of rambling here, but so long as the patient's made aware of all possible outcomes, I, I think that's sufficient, right? And that needs to be documented right. in, the pa- in the patient's chart. Yeah, and there's no way to do that properly with a template process of consent because you're not going to have the same conversation with every patient. Right. Like, not every patient is going to be taking the same con meds, and not every patient is going to need to come off certain con meds in right. order to qualify for the study. But if the patient agrees that that's something they want to do, and the doctor explains the risks of doing that, you know, and the patient still decides that that's something they want to do, that all needs to be documented. Yeah, totally agree. Vice, um, vice versa. Let's say you screen someone and then they decide, no, I don't want to stop my current meds. Then you get a screen fill done, but that should be pro- that should be documented as well. Right, but when it's, when it's a PI who is the treating doctor for this particular individual, I th- think that screen fill can easily be avoided. Right. Because, and it should be avoided because that conversation should be had if you're possibly going to change their meds. That conversation should be right. had prior to consenting this patient. Right. Or during consent, maybe. Uh, At the latest. Right. Well, I, I think this all boils back to this particular individual at the hospital is just concerned about doctors referring their patients, right? And and what are the ethics yeah. behind it? I think... It's if, concerned because they are the treating physicians and they do a lot of surgery stuff there. So it's like, you know, sometimes you don't know if a patient's going to qualify until you actually do the pre-op. Right. And then, you know, you can talk to the patient. Maybe it's hard to find one of these patients. And when you find one, you bend over backwards to try to get them in, right? But that may not be the best option for the patient um and you shouldn't use your influence to persuade them to do that just because it's a tough study to recruit for well again i i mean these are human beings and hopefully they're all adults so i think that's okay left up to the patient right so long as you make them aware of all possibilities right right and you got a document because in reality you know these conversations could be had in like two minutes Yep. But if you don't document that because you don't think that's worth writing down because it was just a two minute conversation, well, then it looks like you didn't really do that. And you, all you did was stop their prescription because if the FDA audits, they don't see that note, but they just see the medical history was just changed like the day of the surgery or whatever they're doing. Okay. So let's, let's, let's uh, drill down on that a little bit. So, would the FDA care, right, if if you're changing, because this gets back to the ethics a little bit, right? If yeah. if you change the patient's meds so that they can qualify for a study, does the FDA care about that? See, I don't think they would. Uh, of course they would. It's the Declaration of Helsinki and it's good clinical practice. Sure, but this happens often, right, in which there's a medication that patients on that they need to wash off of before they can enter the study. Yeah, but there's no way the FDA doesn't, that there's no way the FDA does not care about PIs changing prescriptions just so someone can qualify for a study. But this is a common occurrence. Right. But if it's documented, it's fine. What I'm saying is when it's not documented as to why that happened, it looks like you're just doing that to get people in. Okay, so let's let's let me give you a scenario of something I'm familiar theory, with. Right? You're, you, in theory, you're allowed to do that, but you your rationale has to be written down. Why and and what conversations did you have with the patient? But isn't it but isn't it old, isn't it obvious why it occurred? Like okay, in a typical no, no. If but it's it not is the protocol requires it. 
Right, but if it's not documented in research, it did not happen from the FDA's perspective. Okay, there is so no obvious in- I agree with that. Wholeheartedly agree with that. But if well, let's take a study I'm familiar with, it's recent. Uh, there's a study here now at one of our clinics where a patient's not allowed to be on a number of um, mood stabilizers and the like, right? Yeah. So let's take, let's take lithium. Patient, it's not exclusionary for patients on lithium, but they have to wash off before they can join, right? Okay. So, so that's what the protocol states, right? So right. it's not documented that the patient... Well, I mean, it is documented that the patient will return after, I think it's, I don't remember the time frame. I think it's right. 20 days. Patient will return because they need to wash off of the lithium, right? Right, right. That's the extent of it, right? Patient was screened, found out they were on lithium. Okay, the protocol allows for them to wash off and they can return after that time frame. Right. That's it. Right, right. That's the documentation. And I think that's okay. But if I'm advising sites, especially at uh, nonprofit teaching hospitals that probably have the FDA in there once a year, I would say you need to over-document rationale. Who talked to this patient about washing off? So, and what, and what options did they give them? I I agree. Like I said, I agree and disagree. So I think with the concern of this particular person at the hospital, I think in to to alleviate their concerns, I would agree with you. Document what you're doing, have that conversation prior to enrolling any patients or screening them, or not enrolling, but prior to screening in their case. But I don't think it's necessary for the FDA. I really don't. Well, because you don't they think it's necessary until you get audited and they ask true, you why you're doing Absolutely. Why, but why would you, my, my thing is, why would you even take that risk? Sure, there's if right I unnecessary risk. Yeah, I read it. But the FDA is looking at the protocol. They understand why patient doesn't qualify unless they're off of this drug. They yeah. understand what's going yeah. on. They do. But you don't want them getting into your pre-screening SOPs and finding out, okay, where's coercion here? Do you know what they do in India? They take people off their meds without telling them, put them in a oh, study yeah. without telling them. But I understand. So what's the difference between that and this? It's you having an informed consent. But what, you know, if you're not telling the patient, why you're taking them off of lithium and you just do it. The person's right. not going to argue with you because you're their doctor. But in reality, well, you did it just because they could do a study. The FDA is not stupid. Okay, so those are two different dilemmas, right? So where we're at, it's a strictly a research site, right? So the patient's informed why, they're ta- why they need to come off lithium. Listen, you don't qualify on lithium. You're allowed to wash off if you'd like. That's up to you. Right. 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 At right. a facility. Theory, they're supposed to go to their doctor and tell them, hey, I want to do a study. Right. So I need to come off lithium. And then at that point, it's up to the doctor to tell them, well, I disagree or I agree. Exactly. In either case, it's the patient's right to do whatever they want. Exactly. Now, it's a different scenario but, when... Uh, you're the treating doctor. Yeah. Correct. And that's what I'm talking about. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. And of course you should over document. I would. Sure. I mean, again, I, I don't, uh, it's certainly uh, at worst going to waste only two, three minutes of time to document this, even if it's not necessary, which it very well may be. If you're there, if you're the patient's treating doctor, um, right. You don't want the thing is you don't want the FDA looking for things that they you know you don't want to give them a reason to look deeper into things, right? And if they see like let's say three four patients in a row where you did the same thing as the treating doctor, you stop the certain medication just so they can get in, and they don't see anything written down in the process of consent about a conversation about stopping that med, you better believe they're going to look at the SOPs for the pre screening and see how, exactly how they're doing things. Again, this, in my opinion, to do this correctly, I think that documentation should be in the medical history, the medical records, prior to even screening this patient. Right, right. But in this, and apparently in this hospital, um, the day of treatment and the day of 
because it's like surgery, I think, what they do okay. is okay. the same day. So you've got to stop, you know, a ongoing treatment right away in order to do the study. Okay. So there's no, there's no medical history. Um, there's all you have is this process of consent and documentation. Right. So you've had this conversation. You gave all the options to the patient. Patient agreed they they will want to come off. They understand the risks of coming off. The doctor explained that they don't have to come off. Like you want to protect yourself from regulators. Agreed. Yeah, it's different for a research only clinic, but even there they should write something. Patient talk to their doctor and try to find out from the patient. The doctor either agreed. You know, their treating physician who has nothing to do with the research can either agree that they should come off or tell them, no, you can't come off. And then the patient can decide whether they want to uh, disagree or go against their doctor's advice or follow their doctor's advice. Like that, I think that should be documented also. But I get what you're saying. It's a little more obvious there. But if you were paying me to advise you on how to... um keep the FDA happy, I would tell you to over-document there, too. Well, it's certainly not going to hurt anything. It may be unnecessary, or it might be necessary, but even if it's unnecessary, it's at worst going to cost you a little bit of time to over-document. Right, right. And I think we answered all three of this lady's questions with this podcast. Because her... <laughs> That's one, good. one was about um, stopping existing treatments. One was about undue influence, which is very much related to that. And the other one's about documenting and well, we, medical we history, did, AEs, and all that. We did uh, state something yesterday in which if she, it's a she, correct? Um, yeah. If she really wants to be as ethical as possible, she could, and typically hospitals have two of every specialist, she could have the PI not refer any of their own patients and have that same specialist refer the patients uh, who's not involved in the True. study. Right. So take take neurologists, for example, you could take a neurologist. You have two neurologists at the hospital. One neurologist is the PI. Have the secondary neurologist refer the patients and have the PI, who's also a neurologist, not refer any of their own patients. That would also help with the ethics, I think. That would help, but that would probably hurt enrollment a lot. It might. But if that's their main concern here is ethics, then that's right. one way to hurt. Well, that's one way to move forward. That's one way to move forward. But I still think the documentation should be there, in, in this case, from that other doctor. Or at sure. least from the current PI, what the other doctor told them. Or right. getting a copy of their medical history. At that point, you would get a copy of the medical history from that doctor, and it would include a progress note as to, hopefully, why they stopped the current treatment. Um but yeah, you're right. Like this is a very much gray area. Then this entire hospital is operating in the gray. Well, research in general has a lot, a lot of gray areas. Yeah, life in general has a lot of gray areas. Uh, we disagree on that, but uh, <laughs> for sure, I know we do. That's a topic for another podcast. Yeah, I don't know if it have anything to do with research for sure. Oh, more of the Jordan Peterson variety. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, certainly research. We can agree on the fact that research has a lot of gray area. Oh, without a doubt. Tremendous. And and how difficult do you think this will be for me to clip up this podcast into two, three, one to two minute animated videos to teach these PIs a little uh, bit about ethics. I don't know. It's kind of all rolled together. It might be difficult. Uh, I think I'll do it. I'll try to do it this week. All right. Good luck. And I have no idea why I'm not charging this person, but I feel like there will be other people out there that have the same issue. Oh, sure. All content is good content. I think so. I think it could lead to like more projects for us as a CRO, too. Could be. Well, but, uh, Chris, appreciate this, the time for this podcast. Hopefully you've been recording. Yeah, it's recording. 
thank God. I wouldn't have. To, I wouldn't do this a third time. <laughs> it's it's nope. hard enough to do it twice. But yeah, because I'm not paying attention. This time. Your, your first yeah, five minutes. It was a lot better. This time was a lot better than the first time. Uh, I was paying a little more attention, actually, the first time. Uh, yeah, but it came out much better. Our dialogue was better. The last okay. one we had a fantasy football war room going on in the background. Uh, I mean, that's cool every now and then for random using, but this one I can actually put on YouTube as well. So okay. this is good. This is good. I'm going to go to my lunch meeting, Chris. Um, right. But um, yeah, looking forward to seeing what this person, uh, this person's feedback on this, on this podcast. And then on the three videos I'm about to do um, later on, hopefully today, if I have time. All right. Sounds good. All right, Chris Sauber, I will call you later. And uh, we have a few more calls, I think, later today. And we'll be in touch with everyone else at Guru Nation. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. So, hey, everybody. Thank you very much for listening to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. Again, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this podcast. Make sure you leave a review if you could be so kind, please. Uh, And also go to theclinicaltrialsguru.com if you're interested in learning more about who I am, who some of my guests are. Uh, You can have access to some of my YouTube videos. Uh, I do a lot of videos about clinical research. So go to theclinicaltrialsguru.com and you can also call or text me anytime, 949-415-6256. Also follow me on any social media platform. It's Dan Svera. And you can also email me if you'd like, dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Thank you very much.